Work on Ryan vs. Brandon 2 started several months before filming. We got together once or twice a week after work, and sometimes on weekends, to work on the choreography. Each time we got together to practice, we would bring a camera and record whatever we made up so the next time we could refer to it and remember what we had. As it often goes with these kinds of things, we developed more material than we necessarily intended to use and dropped the stuff we didn't like as we went along. Also, we had been planning on having three or four days at our location to shoot the fight, but as it turned out, a last minute change of plans meant that we'd only have two days to get the whole thing done. So in the end, we opted to omit some of the redundant choreography and try to keep it to our main pieces that we felt confident in being able to perform and shoot quickly. Here's another bit of choreography we didn't end up shooting involving the dual sabers. None of this stuff, even what we really use, looks very good from a static, distant tripod angle, but again, this was just for our own reference, and we knew that when we shot it from the right angles, it would all work much better. We're both pretty proud of how this particular stuff was looking. It's definitely some of our most elaborate and intricate choreography. However, that meant it's also slower to get the performance right and shoot it correctly, so we chose to keep the whole dual saber part down to just a couple of smaller sets and not draw it out too much. One other thing we were playing with was a very experimental idea we were both curious about. Here's a sample. If you couldn't tell, we're not actually fighting. The thought was that if we just filmed enough material of the two of us improvising a fight from the right angles, occasionally we'd get lucky and a couple moves would actually look like they worked. And combined with some fast cut editing, we theorized that it could be possible to make a high energy bit of choreography without any actual choreography. This sort of worked, but we weren't really excited about how it looked. It was more just a curiosity we wanted to try out and didn't do anything with it for the real fight. We had plenty of actual choreography anyway. The downside of getting a head start on your choreography before getting to your location is that you can't work out your fight in the context of the environment very well. For RVB2, we made the decision to shoot at my dad's work, which has an open industrial space which is perfect for the feel of the film. An added benefit is that I was able to drive up there for a weekend before the shoot and figure out some choreography in the space ahead of time. I got my brother, Eric, to stand in for Brandon and directed my dad as cameraman as we explored some ideas on how to utilize the environment. In terms of choreography, one other thing we were working on from the very beginning was to continue the tradition of having one long, unbroken shot of pure choreography somewhere in the fight. Each time we got together, we would practice the stick bash, as we would call it, and then add a little bit more onto the end. So over time, we gradually grew the set longer and longer until the shoot date came around. It was by far our most practiced piece of choreography by the time of shooting. Personally, I also saw this big uber shot as an opportunity to finally utilize a way of shooting that I had been tinkering with for nearly a decade. Around the time the Matrix sequels were coming out, I was testing, with the help of my dad, a rig to spin a camera around on an arm faster than you could move a camera by any typical means. This, combined with shooting slow-mo, I thought could emulate a bullet time type of shot, but without the expense of using an array of still cameras. Admittedly, my early tests are pretty silly, but I, I found it to be a very interesting way of achieving shots that had a very unusual, unique feel. Here are some other tests that I've never previously released, trying to get a grip on how this type of rig could be useful. For RVB2, I thought it could be a great way to display the stick bash. Not doing a, a matrix slow-mo thing with it, but uh, to simply use it in real time as a way to shoot the action by swiftly, smoothly orbiting around it. To do this, it was pretty much the same setup as always, just bigger. Suspended from the ceiling was the arm for the camera and a counterbalance going out to the other direction. The camera was mounted adjustably, so it could be tilted to frame the shot however we needed. The camera could also be mounted anywhere along the arm to give different heights. Like, for example, the one shot that actually is kind of like a matrix shot, the saber slice shot that speed ramps from full speed to slow-mo while orbiting from a distance. Here's a look at us shooting the big stick bash shot where you can see the spin rig at work.
But the spin rig wasn't the only thing different about how we shot RVB2. This was the first saber fight we did to shoot with two cameras simultaneously. We borrowed a friend's HVX200 to complement our own, and flew in Travis Bowles, who was our primary camera operator for Ryan vs. Dorkman 2, to run camera with Michael. In fact, between Travis, Brandon, Dorkman, and myself, it was the same main crew of four back in action. I'm sure Travis is thrilled by me showing this picture. Anyway, shooting the fight with two cameras was a new experience for us, which originally was just something fun we wanted to try, but it actually ended up being very important and beneficial for collecting useful shots more quickly in light of our shortened shooting schedule. If you saw the original choreography competition release of the fight, you'll know the scene ends abruptly and absurdly as a joke. Part of the reason for this is that we didn't want to show the ending until the fight was fully finished with all the effects completed. But it was also partly because we just didn't really like the ending we shot. Here's how the original ending played out. It hits the same beats by playing a fake out with Brandon being wounded, and then a deadly head slice is revealed to be the end of Ryan. When we got into editing, we just didn't really like the shots and decided it was worth it to schedule a reshoot day to drive back up to the location and shoot a better ending. We decided to also add on a little teaser, the clone shot. Those who have followed my work from way back in the 90s might recall a similar effects test where I managed to do a clone shot with a moving camera. To successfully combine several different pieces of footage like this, the key is to move the camera along the exact same path at the exact same speed so that each piece of footage can be matched to the others. I was able to use a LEGO monorail set as a primitive but successful execution of this basic idea, building a camera cart on a short track that was secured to a table and would just ping pong back and forth along the length of its track. For RVB2, I wanted to use the same basic approach, but like the spin rig, much bigger. My dad used pieces of the spin rig to make a linear track with a cable system driven by a motor to move a carriage up or down the track at a specified speed. In the weeks leading up to the reshoot, I did several rehearsal tests to precisely work out the timing of each clone's performance as choreographed to a piece of music. Then the trick is, when shooting with the linear slide rig, the camera must be started from the exact same point on the track at the exact same moment in the music for each take, for everything to match. We shot a take for each clone and did a quick test comp on set to see if it all worked. To my surprise, it all worked perfectly, and the first take of each clone's performance was what we used. After that, it was just a matter of copious amounts of rotoscoping to cut out each clone and integrate them into the shot, keeping all the shadows intact. The linear slide rig was also useful in its non-motorized form as a dolly for a shot that reveals the freshly deceased Ryan for a new ending. Aside from the reshot ending, we didn't really modify the rest of the fight very much for the final release. We tightened up the edit in a couple places to keep it moving along. Here's the most interesting one where I did some fairly intricate effects work to speed up a performance that always bothered me. There were also a handful of other little amusing fix-its, like there always are, like removing Dorkman and his camera from the edge of this shot, or making sure to paint out this guy who was working in the shop while we filmed, or removing my brother who was on catch the saber duty in this shot with protective headgear. Anyway, in addition to the miscellaneous visual effects work was, of course, the Saber rotoscoping itself, which, like the first Ryan vs. Brandon, was taken on by our fans who wanted to help out. Nate Cowie supervised and wrangled the work, and myself and Brandon did final tweaks and polish before rendering them back into the sequence. Beyond that were the two final and surprisingly most time-consuming steps of all. I tackled the sound effects mix. while Brandon handled the final color correction, which was something we never gave a lot of attention to on previous films, but made a huge difference to the whole look and feel of this one. It may have taken a while, but we're both quite pleased with how the whole film turned out, and we're very thankful to everyone who contributed and supports us. We hope you enjoyed this little look behind the scenes of Ryan vs. Brandon 2.